By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have some nice magic for you. We've got an Urnum Aggro deck piloted by Wouter, and he is taking on a, I would almost say, traditional blue and white control deck piloted by Raymond from the Toronto Old School. So these two players are going to play against each other, and they're actually playing against each other for a tournament. This is in the X Point Old School tournament. And maybe you're wondering, X Points, what is X Points? Well, as you know, Old School is really a champion in uh, coming up with new and creative ways to play the game. So there are a lot of different rule sets and X point is a new way of playing uh, the game of old school that we all know and that we all love. So it's another option. And this is a semi-final of, uh, of, of their league. Uh, and their league is organized by Louis. He's a really nice guy. He's, uh, he's also a personal friend of mine. And um, well, you know what? Let's just go to the decks. And before I go to the decks, uh, and explain a little bit more about the format, I would just like to point out that um, you can also check the description below if you want to know more about the format, if you want to maybe join the format, join the tournament, I mean. Um, but you can also skip this whole part. No worries. You can go straight to the old school action by clicking on the timestamp there that's entitled MTG Games, and that will take you straight to the games themselves. Uh, here we are going to continue with explaining a little bit more about what... Uh, old school X points is by looking at the decks of both of these players. I'm going to start by looking at the deck by Wouter Janssen, and that's the Urnum Agro Brew. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Wouter Urnum Agro. And before I go into the specifics of this deck, although it is it is pretty straightforward, right? When you see this uh, this deck picture, it's it's aggro. It wants to kill. But anyway, before I go into the ins and outs of this deck, are things that I notice at least. Uh, let's first talk about the rules, right? So X point singleton, what's going on? What, what X points? What are they talking about? Well, the idea is you build a deck and you can spend seven points, right? And here you can, on the right, you can here see the baseline legal sets, the reprint policy. And then I think the most interesting thing is the restricted cards and their current points. So you see that all these cards have different points. So for example, a time walk is two points an ancestral recall is four points. So when you're creating a deck, you need to think about, okay, what cards have points and how many points can I spend total? Well, the answer to that is you can spend a total of seven points, which is very similar to another format you might know, Seven Point Singleton. And I believe that uh, Louis, the founder of X Points, also discussed with Seven Point Singleton, um, you know, what do you think of this idea? What do you think of the list? And they kind of, they helped each other. So Thomas Ribey and Mikael, helped Louis form uh, this format. And I know that Louis is also a big fan of the seven point singleton. And I think the idea of this is um, when you say you can only spend seven points and the, the most common and powerful cards in magic are costing points, that basically means that you get more variety in the decks. I think that's the main idea. So by making it costly, to play with your usual suspects, such as Ancestral Recall, you know, it's four points, you can only spend seven. You really have to think, okay, I'm gonna play this card, but then maybe I'm not able to play, for example, my Library of Alexandria, who's also four points. So in this format, as the point list is right now, it's un you're unable, it's impossible to play Library of Alexandria and Ancestral Recall in the same deck. And um, that's a choice, you know, it's a choice you can make. And I think that, like I said, the goal here is to just get a lot of diversity of decks. And the nice thing with these new formats is uh, because it's all online and you have a lot of people online to play, you can just see, okay, how is it going to enroll? And, and also in the game that we're going to look at today in this video, we can just see and you can judge for yourself, is this an interesting format? Um, now let's kind of zoom into the deck of Wouter. So I've named it after, you know, Urnum Jin, the 4-5 powerhouse and what makes this this card so playable is that it's only one green, right? It's uh, it's one green and three to to cast. So that is really good value for a four or five creature. And the fact that it's one green makes it splashable in so many different decks, especially in the old school format where you have your dual lands, you have your city of brass. There are just so many ways to get the mana you need. You've got the Moxon, of course, Moxon being a little bit less accessible 
in this X point system because they're, they're points, right? So you got to think about, okay, am I putting a Mox in? I probably got to leave another really good card out. So I guess that kind of makes it interesting. And when you look at this deck of Wouter, you can see it is actually powerless. Doesn't mean it's not powerful, but there are no power nine cards in this brew. And uh, if we look at the, the rest of the color green, it's mainly these Urnum Gins, four Urnum Gins, four fatties, then he's playing uh, with two Sylvan Libraries. Of course, Sylvan Library is great in an aggro deck like this because your average CMC is two, yeah, two somewhere, maybe some cards are three. The Urnum, of course, is four, but that's really the top of the CMC. And um, that means that you can run out of cards really quickly. Sylvan Library allows you to sort your cards, but also allows you to draw extra cards if you, can, uh, if you have the life to spend, of course, four life per extra card with a max of drawing two cards extra per turn. He, he's also got the regrowth. That's kind of a no brainer as well. Uh, interesting to see that Sylvan Library doesn't have points uh, assigned to it yet. And I'm saying yet because the thing with X point singleton is that the point list changes. So after a tournament, there's always a moment uh, where players and, and the community discusses with each other um, wh what, would, what cards would be eligible to get a point or to go a point up or to go a point down or maybe even get, go off the list completely. And I believe, but maybe Louis, if you're watching this video, you can explain that in the comments below. I believe you're the one in the end that makes the decision before a new tournament starts so that everybody knows prior to a tournament, okay, this is the list for this tournament. And after a tournament, there's a revision. And then when there's a new tournament, okay, guys, this is the new list for the tournament. Okay, so now we've kind of looked at green in Wouter's uh, brew. If we look at white, again, I see a lot of uh, the strong and I guess also the obvious choices, right? You've got three swords to plow steers instead of four. So that's kind of nice. Three swords to plow steers and then an army of Allah. I think army of Allah is great because it's an instant. Plus two plus O, oh, instant speed for your entire army, which also works great with first strike. So I'm looking at those orders of light burr there at the top. He's also playing with three disenchants and uh, Savannah Alliance, of course. So, you know, white is really in this. And uh, oh yeah, balance, obviously, is kind of a no-brainer to put balance in there. You see most decks that play with white and uh, it makes sense, right? They play balance, swords, and disenchant. And then maybe a few other cards, but those are really the main cards and they kind of give you the control element in your deck. Now then when we look at red, I mean, red is even, even almost simpler, I, uh, I want to say. He's just saying, you know what? I want these games to be over with as quick as possible. I'm gonna play four chains, four bolts. That's eight times three points of direct damage. That's 24 points of direct damage. So only with his chains and his bolts in a, a perfect situation, he can just roast his opponent. He doesn't need any of the fancy creatures, right? Um, of course, he's playing with the Wheel of Fortune, which I think is very powerful in this deck because you run out of cards so quickly. So just dumping all your cards, uh, on the battlefield, putting tons of pressure on your opponent and then drawing into Wheel of Fortune. That would be perfect for Wouter here. And he's also playing with the Kurt Apes. I really like the Kurt Apes. I love Tiger Kurt Ape. It's one of the kind of the oldest little combo synergies uh, that, that I saw at least when I started playing Magic. Really nice. So it's a one red, it's a one one. And when there's a forest in play, it gets a bonus plus one plus two, becomes a two three. That means when you've got a Tiger as an opener, you have a two three creature for one mana. That is serious, serious power. Um, okay, we've got some sideboards uh, action here, which is interesting. He's playing with Armageddon in there, so he can kind of turn it into an Urnimgannon deck if he feels the need for that. And, you know, that might be possible because he's playing against a control deck that wants to get the game to mid-game, late-game, and maybe a well-placed Armageddon can kind of set the control deck back because control decks are usually, I'm saying usually, not all the time, but usually slower, especially slower than this deck. So maybe playing a lot of creatures and then turn three or turn four, dumping an Armageddon, that can maybe set the control player so far behind that it's like a guaranteed victory. We also see four red elemental blasts. I believe his opponent is playing with blue as well. So I think after sideboarding, we're in for a red elemental blast, blue elemental blast war. That's always an option. Okay, this is the deck of Wouter. Now let's take a look at uh, the deck of his opponent, the blue and white control brew. Let's go. And here we see the deck of Raymond and it is really a blue and white control deck, right? It's very, this really has a strong old school vibe. 
Again, we can see those dice on a different points. The first thing I notice is that we do have some power in this deck in the form of the uh, Mox Sapphire there. And of course, the Time Walk, very powerful cards make sense that he's playing them. We do not see a Mox Pearl, by the way. And of course, Mox Pearl would also take two points. So I wonder uh, what his reasoning was. I think I know, I can give a guess, but maybe Raymond, when you're watching this video, let me know why you left out the Mox Pearl, because I could be wrong. I didn't make this deck, right? <laughs> but looking at your deck, I think the choice was a Mox Sapphire will give me that double blue and counter spell and mana drain is so important in any control deck. Um, you know, I want to be able to play that out ASAP. So by having that Mox Sapphire and, and maybe a Tundra or just a, a basic island in hand, that will give you that immediately double blue threat. And the nice thing about, um, and I play with blue a lot, as you probably know when you're watching this video, you've watched other videos on the channel. The nice thing about blue is you can have the threat of a counter spell be almost as powerful as the counter spell itself. So even when you don't have a counter spell, but you play it in a certain way and you counter at certain specific key moments, you can kind of give your opponent that idea that you always have a counter spell in your hand. Now, I'm definitely not a master in that manipulation game, but uh, you know, maybe Raymond, maybe you are, we're gonna find out in a moment when we look at the actual match. Now, looking at this deck, the other cards that have points on them are the Mana Drain, the Balance, and the Chaos Orb. I think Chaos Orb, if you have that card, you're probably going to include it. It's only one point. It's cool to flip. It's very old school. And it is a very good card. Two to cast, one in pay, and you can just destroy any permanent on the board. Of course, the big challenge with your Chaos Orb is when you activate it, your opponent can respawn. So they can respawn with a Crumble, with a Shatter, with a Disenchant. He's now playing against uh, Wouter, of course, and both of these players play with Disenchant. So it's going to be rough for the Chaos Orb to kind of find activations. Not impossible, rough. Talking about like disenchanting, one of the things I noticed here, and I kind of like that strategy uh, by Raymond, is he's playing with a lot of artifacts. Three JM Day Tomes, two IC Manipulators, four Felwer Stones, so he's really heavy on wanting to have enough mana to do what he wants to do. And when you have a lot of mana in your deck, of course, and a lot of mana ramp going on, then JM Day Tome is a perfect fit, you know, a perfect glove, because JM Day Tome, Four to cast, four and tap, you can draw into a card. And because he has all the Felwer Stones and that added Mox, he will probably have enough mana to activate the Jam Day Tome, kind of looking for maybe a powerful creature or maybe looking for an answer to a threat on uh, on the board if Wouter uh, manages to just get a lot of creatures on there. So I, I really like that idea. But just kind of to get back to um, all the artifacts, I think when you're making a deck and you're playing with artifacts, there are two ways to look at it. You can say, I'm only going to play the artifacts that I really need, but then you have to keep in mind that the opponent will use their artifact removal to get rid of the artifacts that you do play because, you know, your opponent can hardly find a target. Another strategy is I'm going to play with a lot of artifacts. My opponent will not be able to disenchant or, or destroy all my artifacts. I think Felwer Stone is a nice example here. You play Felwer Stone turn, turn, uh, turn two or turn three, and your opponent is like, ooh, I really don't want him to ramp up into four, four or five mana a turn early, so I'm just gonna disenchant. I'm not saying that's a bad decision, but it does mean that your opponent has one disenchant less or one shatter less or whatever he has to take care of an artifact uh, to answer your other threat, so to answer your Icy or to answer your Jam Day Tome that may be coming to the game later. Another nice example of this, now that we're kind of zooming into Disenchant because both players are playing with it, is that uh, Raymond here is playing with Moats. Three Moats. I mean, that is pretty diehard. Moat Enchantment from Legends that says that you can only be attacked by creatures that have flying, right? So uh, when you've got your Moat out, all those ground creatures, and Wouter has got mostly ground creatures, they cannot do anything. So if Raymond for some reason kind of gets Wouter to a point where he's used up all his disenchants and then casts the moat, that would be an ideal situation. Or cast the moat and have a counter spell in hand to protect the moat and of course the two blue open to do so. Um, I think this is really going to be kind of a sprinting game where you will see Wouter really trying to sprint to the end as fast as he can with his lightning bolts and his savannah lines and just all his quick one and two drops, all his threats that he wants to put to the table as soon as possible. And you'll see the, the control deck doing what a control deck does, answering, managing the threats, trying to drag the game, 
making it from a sprint into um, into a um, into a long distance run, a marathon. That's the word I'm looking for. Into a marathon, really slowing it down. Probably using counter spells at the right time, using uh, swords to plow spears at the right time. Then slowly going into that turn four, turn five, turn six, where he gets to deploy, um, you know, his icy manipulator. Um, and, and, and maybe his bigger creatures like Sarah Angel and of course the moats and then from there on out he's gonna gonna take over the game and he's gonna lean more in towards what for example a, a deck like the deck wants to do win through card advantage right so get your jam day tomes out slowly draw more take control of the game you know play out your Sarah Angels and then kind of win so I think but even then, even when you're in that stage of the game, and I'm really curious how that's going to unfold, even if you're at that stage of the game, it's still going to be kind of a nail biter because, um, and I think Raymond will probably discover this soon enough, when you're too low against a deck that plays with burn, you can just get killed out of nowhere. So I think maybe a Swords to Plowsiers can be a way for Raymond to gain life and maybe survive a Lightning Bolt, for example. I think that's a very plausible scenario to happen in this matchup. Now, um, the card uh, that I would like to discuss just before we move on here is Azure Drake. So Azure Drake, one blue and three to cast for a two, four flyer. And you're probably thinking, why not play with an Urnum Jin? Urnum Jin is one blue and two to cast. It's a three, four flyer instead of a two, four. And yes, it deals one damage a turn, but it's way stronger. Well, that one damage can be pretty decisive. So that can actually, that alone can be a reason not to play it. When we look at the cards of Raymond, he doesn't want to play quick. He doesn't have that strategy. He wants to go mid game, late game. So uh, an early aggressive creature that deals damage to the player that casts this, cast it doesn't really fit in the strategy of what this deck wants to do, right? Another reason is City in a Bottle. City in a Bottle, of course, being very powerful, taking care of all the Arabian Nights threats for just two mana of any color. It's an artifact, right? So that also makes the Azure Drake more powerful. Another option besides playing with the Azure Drake could have been the Ghost Ship. Now Ghost Ship, two four for four mana as well. But the big difference with Ghost Ship is it's too blue to cast. And that is probably why he's chosen the Azure Drake. Azure Drake is easier to drop. It's still a four toughness creature, so it's harder to kill. It doesn't die to a chain or a bolt. I think it's a, it's, it's a very good choice and he's playing with four of them. So not just like two or three, no, four of them. So I'm really curious to see the role of Ezra Drake. I think it's a beautiful card. It's fantastic art in general, by the way, this, this deck looks, uh, looks amazing, Raymond. So yeah, curious to see how this is going to, uh, to unfold. I should say unfold. I said unroll, I think early in this video, I meant unfold. Sorry for my bad English here. So uh, this is the deck of Raymond. Let's go to the first game, okay. Game number one, and we see Wouter on the play here, starting with the Plateau into a Curd Ape. Wouter, you should have played a Taiga. That would have been better. Let's take a look. What's going to happen here? We see a basic island and a pass turn. So that means it looks like at least one damage here and a pretty slow start. Oh, this is nice as a Vanna. That means it's got a pump. It's now a 2-3 creature attacking here. Raymond dropping to 18. Will there be more pressure? There is another Kurt Ape and a pass turn. Now remember, Raymond is of course going to find double blue, playing a Flower Stone. Interesting. I thought maybe he would keep his counter magic open. On the other hand, he's got two apes against him. So you're probably making a very good decision here, trying to ramp up into something powerful, maybe an Azure Drake to stop. And there we see a Swords on one of the two Kurt Apes. That means two life for Wouter, but that's not that relevant. Raymond's going to drop to 16 here, and we see another Kurt Ape. And that means four damage again on the board. I think if Raymond can now cast an Azure Drake, he is pretty safe. Let's see what he can do. He can also cast a Moat, by the way. He's got four mana. Felwerstone also being white because of uh, the Lance of Wouter there. Let's see, there we see an Azure Drake. So the 2-4 flyer that we talked about in the deck tech section. Really, really beautiful art. Really a big fan of that card. Nice to see it in action. There is a plateau and now Wouter needs something. He's attacking with both. So probably there's going to be a bolt here or a chain on the Azure Drake. So remember, the Kurt Apes are 2-3, so they're not going to die. So that means two damage dealt here by Wouter to Raymond. But I guess we're not in, the, in that phase yet. Bouter seems to be a little bit in the tank, maybe thinking, am I going to 
Use it or keep... Oh, Army of Allah! That is interesting. I didn't see that one coming. I really thought about a bolt. I think this is quite a nice decision here by Valter because he gets rid of the creature of Raymond and he also deals an extra two points of damage to Army of Allah giving plus two plus O oh to all his creatures. And it's two white and one to cast. I find I find Army of Allah really, really a strong card. And there we see an icy. And of course, the problem here of the icy manipulator is it only taps down one creature. Another side note is that because Wouter has been able to put so much pressure on Raymond, Raymond hasn't been able to just counter a single single card from Wouter because he constantly is forced to tap out to play answers. And there is an Urnum, even more problems for Raymond. Really needs another source here, I feel. Or at least a blocker. Okay, this is not too bad. Finding a blocker and having that one mana open to tap down the Urnum with the Icy Manipulator next turn. And now the Ezra Dray gains Forced Walk because of the Urnum. Not very relevant, but you know, you never know. There's a Taiga. I think the Kurt Apes are feeling more and more like in their habitat, you know, with the Savannas and the Taigas. So there's a tap down of the Urnum, blocking one of the Kurt Apes. Gonna drop to eight here. And no shenanigans here by Wouter. And look at his hand size. Only two cards in hand still. Another Urnum. Only one card in hand now. And this is that kind of that um, 100 meter sprint that I was talking about in the deck deck. This is what Wouter wants to do. He just wants to end this game as quickly as possible. Ooh, this could get Raymond back. Time walk attacking for two, of course. Tapping down one of his lands here. Untapping, taking turn. If he can play another big creature, at least I can give him some breathing space. He's still on eight. Another land. He really needs to play something. Unfortunately, he cannot. He just passes stern, only having two cards in hand himself as well. And he's declaring attack. So in response to that, he's stepping down one of the Ernie's, attacking with the rest of them. Now the question is, is Raymond going to block the Urnum. He's probably just going to take the damage drop to two, although he knows he's playing against an opponent that has bolts and chains. Well, he doesn't know it, but I guess when you're looking at this deck, it's uh, it's to be expected. Then again, you need to play towards your out. So he's taking the damage. Ezra Drake blocking a Kurde, taking six, dropping to two. Wouter obviously, well, if he has a bolt, Raymond has enough counter magic. Oh, I like this play, Wheel of Fortune, expecting a counter spell here. Or not? Yes, Counterspell. Okay, yeah, that was to be expected, of course. It would be sweet if Wouter, after this, fires a bolt, but he doesn't. And, of course, a good decision by Raymond because, you know, he's on two right now, so he's in bolt range. I mean, if Raymond can still win this... Okay, he's scooping up, he's scooping up the cards. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to say, if he still win this, he needs, like, he needs a miracle. He needs the perfect storm or something. Anyway... A quick win by Wouter, and really, um, just by looking at this first game, you already kind of have an idea how these games will unfold. If a game takes long, it's probably going to be a win by Raymond. If a game goes very quickly, like this one, probably Wouter is going to win with his aggro brew. Okay, both these players are going to go into the sideboards, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. So Wouter being one up, but that does mean that Raymond is on the play, which is a big difference here. He can get to counter magic quicker. You know, Wouter gets to attack one turn later. So I, th I, th I think it, it makes a big difference here. There is a Tundra by Raymond. And there is a Plateau into a Savannah Lion. And a pass turn here. There is an island, so now we've got counter magic, but again, a quick creature by Wouter, so he can start dealing damage again. He can do that game again. There's the City of Brass. Attacking here, gonna drop to 18. I wonder if he's gonna play something else. Of course he wants to. Okay, City of Brass taking a damage. Okay, Savannah Lines and a Curdip. There is a blue elemental blast on the Curdip. So this is the kind of sideboard shenanigans that we can expect. And interesting that Wouter kind of chose to play both of those creatures at the same time. Um, of course, this is like fast forwarded. So maybe he said, first I'm going to play the Savannah, then I'm going to play the Kurdip, because that can actually be relevant. 
Um, attacking with both Savannah lines here. Oh, look at that life total of Raymond going down quickly, just like we saw in the first match. There's an Order of Lightbird, the Pump Knight. No counterspell from Raymond. Ay, 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 he needs, he needs something. Four mana. Okay, there's a moat. This is a good, a good card here for Raymond. This is perfect. Now, if Wouter has a disenchant, this game could be over very, very quickly. Oh, and they're actually discussing the altar on the card. Oh, I, I think I saw this one online as well. You see a lot of creatures around the moat. Beautiful altar and also a beautiful deck by Raymond, I must say. Of course, he's going to flip here. Yep, yep, yep. Of course, he's going to flip. Going to flip. Actually, this is kind of a flip for the game, right? Ooh. Oh, I think he misses it. Oh, it's a miss. Oh, that is painful. I've been seeing a lot of orb flips go wrong. And... Oh man, but there was a lot of like tension on this orb flip. Remember, this is kind of the semifinals. There is a Sarah Angel to make matters even worse here for Wouter. Oh man. I mean, if he can just get a disenchant in the swords, I mean, all is good. It looks like he doesn't have that. Tapping two, there's a regrowth. Is he going to get back? Oh, he's going to flip again. Oh, I respect this. He does have to wait a whole turn. That means that Raymond can actually untap and maybe find a disenchant or maybe having a disenchant hand and responding to the activation next turn. I mean, that flip, ooh, that could have been the, the decision maker here for this uh, second game. We see Wouter here dropping uh, to 14. Of course, taking some damage from his own City of Brass earlier. That's why he took that other two damage. There is an Icy Manipulator. And this is really the kind of game that Raymond wants to play, but with by playing that Icy, he's kind of showing uh, to Wouter, I don't have a disenchant for the orb. I don't think it would have mattered much there. Oh, finally, it's a hit. <laughs> you can see him kind of taking more time. Um, there is the hit. And now the question is, is he going to attack? Remember, Raymond can tap down one of the creatures, block one, uh, you know, and basically kill it because of the Sarah. Or does Wouter maybe have Army of Allah that he can still play? Two white and one to cast. It's instant plus two plus O for all his creatures. He's attacking. He's. I wonder what's going to happen here. So he's tapping down probably the Pump Knight, the Order of Lightbur, right? Oh man, I wonder what's going to happen. And now he has to decide, Raymond, that is, am I going to block or am I just walking into a trap? Should I just take the damage? And he is going to block. Savannah line that so I guess it was a bluff here. Are we gonna see a chain or a bolt? We are gonna see something And another another line, okay, I was kind of thinking about maybe a chain there In the second main phase, but about are just playing another line. I do think it's a good decision to kind of bluff an attack and You know he dealt some more damage He knows that he's not gonna win it if this game, you know, goes into that late game stage because Raymond just has bigger, bigger and better cards. It's as simple as that. There's damage because of the City of Brass. Oh, Time Walk. That is pretty brutal. We saw a Time Walk in game one as well. Game two, there's a Time Walk also. And he's going to attack on a drop to five here. Remember, City of Brass can tap, or sorry, Icy can tap City of Brass, dealing even more points of damage. And look at that, Wouter's life total all of a sudden is on five. He's under huge pressure here. At least he needs an answer to the Sarah Angel next turn. We see Raymond kind of being in the tank here, looking at the mana count, playing another Fowler Stone for two white mana. Having two cards in hand. Passing turn here. Okay, let's see what's gonna happen. Wouter, you need an answer. Just attacking with everything. I like the aggression here. You gotta, you gotta make it difficult. You gotta say to your opponent, Raymond, you know what? You have to make the decisions here. And he's, is he not using his icy? Yeah, of course he's using his icy. I thought for a moment there he wouldn't use his icy. Probably again gonna choose for the pump knight. Gonna block one of the lines. It's gonna take two. It's gonna go to ten. It looks like there's no bolts or any other tricks here from Wouter, which is problematic. He needs an answer. For that Sarah Angel or he's dead next turn. Remember, Raymond can attack for four with the Sarah and can then tap the City of Brass with his Icy Manipulator, killing Wouter with his own city. So Wouter needs something here. If he has a chain, if he has a bolt, he needs to play it now. 
For a moment, I thought he was going to play it. No, he's passing turn. I think we're going to have a 1-1 here. There's an attack. Going to go to 1. There's the tap of the city. And that's it. Dead. Okay, it's a 1-1. I like 1-1s because that means we're going to go to game number 3. Game number 3-1-1. One, one. Wouter is on the play here, which is uh, actually very good for him. And uh, yeah, let's see how this is going to unfold. I wonder, I think if Wouter would have hit that flip in game two, I think he would have he would have won, especially with that regrove later, and then he could have taken care of the Sarah. But if, if, if doesn't count in magic. Uh, this is a great start for Wouter, by the way. Kurt Ape, Taiga Kurt Ape, classic opener, 2-3 creature on the board here. And uh, Raymond playing that lovely Tundra again, passing turn. And let's see, there is a Plateau. Attack here for two, will we see a Swords? Yes, we're going to see a Swords. And that's uh, very good news for Raymond. And no creatures by Bowter, just has to pass turn here. More good news for Raymond, that is. Second blue means counter magic open now. Hasn't been really able to counter much. Okay, preferring to play a Felberstone instead, going for that... Uh, the tempo play. There we see another Taiga. No creatures again. I wonder what's in that hand of Wouter. Because he's playing with so many like cheap one drops, but no Zaven Alliance. And no more Kurt Apes. There is a Jam Day Tome. And this is interesting. An interesting decision by Raymond here because next turn Wouter will have four mana, and four mana is also the casting cost of an Urnum Jin. So of course, I don't know what's in his hand, but if he has counter magic, that would have probably be a preference. Because look, now we're going to see an Urnum here. Urnum Jin, 4-5 Powerhouse on the board. Maybe he has a Swords, of course, to deal with it. Or an Icy Manipulator that he can play out now. I mean, he's got some answers. Or a Moat. Okay, there we see. There's an Icy. I mean, he's got so many answers to creatures, I guess. He doesn't have to worry if he cannot counter them. And, okay, playing another Taiga. Probably going to declare attacks, and in response, the Urnum will be tapped down. Okay, there's a Dishenchant, and he's tapping down the Urnum. An interesting thing here is, I'm not sure if Wouter, did Wouter have an extra Dishenchant in the sideboard? I think, oh, of course, Defined Offering came from the sideboard, so he did play some extra Artifact Removal. Ooh, look at this. Ivory Tower, not really relevant, but that Sarah Angel... And remember, Raymond is playing with four Sarah Angels, so it's not a surprise that he gets to find them all the time. That is simply part of his strategy. Attacking with the 4-5, Raymond going to drop to 16. And let's see, of course, Wouter is on, uh, on 25, which is pretty nice. There is a Swords on the Angel. And on, the, on one hand, it's really nice that you've got a Swords to deal with the Angel. On the other hand, I think when you're Wouter, you're also like, ah, I want to play aggressive and I want to give life to my opponent. You know, because basically he's giving away a whole turn. There is a Chaos Orb. Question is, is he going to flip? We've already seen Disenchant and the Divine Offering. So yeah, there's no response here. There's the flip. Urnum is gone. And uh, taking a damage, going to 24, playing Order of Lightbird, the Pump Knight. And it's called a Pump Knight because you can give it plus one, plus O. Oh. You can also give it First Strike, card from the Fallen Empire's expansion. An expansion that you can play in the uh, X Point format. And there's an attack here. They're also playing with Mana Burn, I believe, by the way. So Raymond dropping here to 17. But this is still manageable here for Raymond. You know, he can, he can kind of take the damage for a few turns. If it's just two or three damage, it's okay. And he can finally, you know, he can try to find some cards. So Raymond dropping to 14. There, Wouter taking a damage, playing a Savannah Alliance. Slowly building up a, a board state here. And okay, there's the counter spell on the Savannah Lines. Ooh, Red Elemental Blast. Savannah Lines is gonna stick. And we didn't see a single Red Elemental Blast in game two, but I already thought, you know, I mean, Wouter must have boarded those in, right? And he did. And so we just saw them in action. And that's what you wanna do with those Red Blasts, just get rid of those counter spells. 
And there's the attack, and attack for four. Remember, he can pump it for two white, give it plus one, plus oh, dealing five in total. That means Raymond's gonna drop to nine. Ooh, and this is difficult here for Raymond. Ooh, finding a maze of if. That is actually pretty sweet. He can send back the Order of Light Bear, only taking two more damage. So that's gonna slow the pain down a little bit at least. Attacking with both, probably, yeah, gonna send back the Order, right? Exactly, gonna take two, gonna drop to seven. So Raymond is dying, but he's dying slowly. And as long as he's dying slowly, he can get out from underneath the pressure. He needs to just find a moat and he's all good. Or, I don't know, just find um, a creature to block one of the attackers. Looks like he's not finding it. Three cards in hand, passing turn here. And it's really nice to see that both players are kind of showing the amount of cards that they have in hand makes it easier that's something that's sometimes a little bit difficult when you play online instead of face to face so there's the maze again and of course the two damage he's on five and things are looking pretty good for Valtteri here i mean i have to say every turn i'm kind of expecting raymond to to kind of play a big creature or you know play another icy there's the mana drain on the other pump knight which which is going to buy him another turn i mean things are going very slow He's on a three-turn clock. Ooh, interesting. There is a city in a bottle that takes care of those urnums. And there is a balance. And his hand's empty. Oh, oh, this is bad news. He's tapping down, though. There's a disenchant on the city in a bottle. And his own balance is gone. Oh, this is great news for Raymond. And now they're going to count their, uh, their lands. Looks like Raymond's got to put a few lands away here. It doesn't matter much, though. Both players having a lot of lands to their uh, disposal. And I really like this play by Raymond emptying his hand. And that's a nice thing about artifacts. Uh, Balance doesn't care much for artifacts. So that city in the bottle was kind of a freebie here for Raymond. And this is what, what Raymond wants, right? Get it into the into the late game, probably finding a jam day tome. Ooh, but this is bad news. Of course, oh, Raymond has, of course, the, the Maze of If. That's going to be a key card here. There's another Felwar. And oh, look at that control magic. Classical move here from the control player. Getting a marker here, writing it down. Earn him gin. I hope, Raymond, that's not a Timmy that you're using for that. I hope it's not a Timmy. Anyway, Urn and Jin on the control magic and uh, passing turn here. And this means now that uh, Raymond's kind of in the clear, right? He's on five, he's out of bolt range, which is okay. And um, yeah, he can start dealing some damage with the Ernie of his opponent. Okay, but Wouter finding a pump knight here. And we don't see a counter spell from Raymond. And tapping the urn and giving forest walk. Not very relevant. No forests on the side of Raymond. He's probably going to attack or not. I mean, he's got to think about it now. Going to attack, of course, here with the 4 5. And I'm expecting Wouter to still take the damage exactly. I mean, Wouter is just looking for an opener. Um, you know, Raymond is very low on life, so. There's still a chance for him to kind of win this game. Ah, the time walk again. Every game so far, we've seen that time walk by Raymond. And it's it's always really nice because it's an extra combat step. And if we look at the life total of Wouter, he's going to drop already to 11 here. That means he's on a three-turn clock at the moment. And he's only drawing one measly card a turn very, very slowly. This game unfolds. Raymond's probably gonna attack at a certain point. Wouter will have to block. Of course, Wouter is hoping for one more white mana because then he can pump his pump knight up to five power in total. Two white for plus one plus oh, so he's got five white on his side of the board. If he can find white mana number six, he can do something. Okay, there's his event line. Actually, not too bad because he can just then just um, chump block the urnum or he can choose to double block. Which is also interesting. He can pump the knight, give it, uh, make it into a three-one, and double block. 
that is not too bad. And of course, then Raymond in response can use his, uh, his Maze of If, but he doesn't really want to do that. Another scenario is that he attacks, Valtor takes the damage, and next turn Valtor attacks with both creatures. And then he can put Raymond on three life, and that would mean he's in bolt range. Yet another scenario is Raymond attacking here with the Urnum after damage is dealt, untapping his own Urnum, well, the stolen Urnum that he controls with his Maze of If. A lot of scenarios. Let's see what's going to happen. Attacker with the Urnum, we see a quick double block by Valter. Doesn't have to think twice about this. Interesting. Urnum is dead. So to me, that kind of indicates that Valter doesn't have a bolt in hand. Then again, if he would have, then he would have probably blocked with his um, with his Order of Lightbird earlier and, and played the Bolt. Although, you know, the thing is with Maze, it's a hard card to deal with because you can also use it defensively. So if Wouter has some kind of combat trick, Raymond can always, in response, use his Maze of If. But anyway, he double blocked it. Urnum's gone. Both the creatures of Wouter are gone. Wouter is now on six. Raymond is on seven. And there is a bolt. He's going to drop to three. And of course, the reason that he's getting life is because of that ivory tower. Oh, so that ivory tower is all of a sudden becoming relevant again. When he played it, his hand was like empty, right? It was useless. But now we see that ivory tower is really helping Raymond kind of get back into this. Well, he was never out of it, but you know what I mean? Becoming dominant, no longer having to be afraid of that burn. Every turn he's going to gain life. And this is a bad sign for Wouter. When you're Wouter, you're like, oh, you're so frustrated. Remember, Wouter had that disenchant in hand, but had to use it against the city in a bottle because of that balance earlier in the game. Couldn't keep a disenchant. And at that moment, the ivory tower just wasn't very relevant. And now there's a second ivory tower. This 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 game is slipping away out of the hands of Wouter here. And if you're Raymond, you're happy right now. Seven in hand, gaining tens of life, sitting back, passing turn. Everything is good. Manana, manana. Maybe even seeing a counter spell here. But he's thinking, you know what? I've got a mace. I've got life. Why would I counter? And now he's got that card number eight. I'm expecting him to play something here. Okay, playing a city in a bottle. Oh, what a brutal way. City in a bottle is just, it's such a good card. And and I think this is it. Yep, this is it. Wouter is saying, you know what? There's nothing I can do. You've got this. And, and Wouter, I think you're right. But I mean, let's get back to that game number two moment and that moment uh, where that flip was missed. If that flip would have hit, I think we would have had a different outcome. Congratulations to Raymond though, you're the winner. If doesn't count in Magic the Gathering, you've won this one. And it was really nice to see in game number three how those ivory towers all of a sudden became relevant again. And that means that we are going to see Raymond's control deck in the finals of this X Point Old School League. Let me know what you think of this type of magic in the comments below. What do you think of this new rule set? I would also like to thank Bouter and Raymond for showing their decks here on the channel. And uh, I'm really looking forward, Raymond, to see your deck again next week in the finals of X Point Old School Magic. I would also like to thank Louis for recording this match and sending it out to me. It's always nice to see other players and other decks play and new formats play and see how they kind of work out. And of course, last but not least, I would like to thank you, the viewer, for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And uh, if you enjoyed this and if you want to help the channel grow, you can do so by leaving a like, leaving a comment, subscribing if you're not a sub yet. And um, you can also become a patron of the channel. What is that? Well, patron, you can become that by visiting a website called Patreon. There's an info card probably popping up right now. Click on that info card and you can see how you can help the channel grow and flourish if you like the content that I make. So just click on the link and starting from $1 a month, you can already sponsor Timmy Talks. Talking about sponsors and helpers and all that stuff. Let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, amazing, wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Doctors think it is some magazine. 